All right, so let's keep talking about community ecology here. So keep in mind all the different populations in a given area, how they interact, how they work together, how they compete with each other, how they prey upon each other. All of these dynamics inter and interactions are all part of community ecology. So we left off last time talking about relationships that exist within communities. Predator-prey is a basic relationship. You will always have predators and prey in every community. Some predators are on the top of the food chain. Others are in the middle of the food chain. So keep in mind, some, everything has to have energy and it's always going to be eating something else to get that energy. So we're going through the snowshoe hair and the lynx uh, data, talking a little bit about that last time. But now let's jump to the next slide and I want to put this into a more Illinois based example here. Coyotes and rabbits. We have them all over the place. Coyotes like to eat rabbits. Coyotes prey upon rabbits. That's one of their food sources. So you have a direct predator-prey relationship going between a coyote and a rabbit. But people like to hunt rabbits. They like to go out and hunt, shoot the rabbit, kill the rabbit, and then eat the rabbit. So we are also a predator to the rabbit population. So quite often conversations will happen where people think, well, if we eliminate the coyotes, then the rabbit population will go up and there will be more rabbits for us to hunt. It'll be easier to hunt rabbits. We'll have more fun. We'll be more successful. Boom. Let's eliminate coyotes. So what they're banking on and what they're, they're playing with is the predator prey population cycle we just looked at. So let me redraw some of it. So here's rabbit will be blue. If the rabbit population goes up, the coyote population will start to go up because there's more rabbits available. There's more food. So the coyotes have an easier time getting them. As the coyote population goes up, it puts pressure on the rabbits, causing the rabbit population to decline. Okay, so there's less rabbits because they're all getting eaten by coyotes. But now as the rabbit population declines, so does the coyote population because there's less food available for the coyotes. So their population goes down. This takes pressure off the rabbits and their population should start to rise again. So some folks think, well, if we suppress the coyote population, keep it down here, don't let it go up, keep it low by killing coyotes, then that will allow the rabbit population to go up and stay up here. And as hunters, we then have an easier chance of hunting. You know, maybe we kill some rabbits and their population kind of does this, but it won't drop way down like it does because of the coyotes. Okay, so on the surface, that may sound like a great thing to think about. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, if we do eliminate coyotes or reduce the coyote population, it will play a role in suppressing the pressure on the rabbits. But what we also have to think about, hmm, who else in Illinois eats a rabbit? What about hawks? That's supposed to be a hawk there, with big sharp claws. So now the hawk population is doing the same oscillation because they're also eating rabbits. And now if the coyotes are not there, the hawk population goes up even more because they're not competing against the coyotes for the same food source. Who else would eat a rabbit? Maybe we have larger snakes. Same scenario. Their population oscillates with the rabbit. And if you reduce the coyotes, there's more rabbits. There's more food for these predators. But the biggest one, the biggest variable in this entire equation is where the rabbit's living, their habitat. How much habitat is available for the rabbit population? Because I don't care if you eliminate all of your predators, if your carrying capacity 
of your environment used to be here and then it drops down to here you're never going to get your rabbits up above that carrying capacity eliminate all the predators you want carrying capacity and habitat is more important naturally these populations will balance themselves out but the habitat is the critical thing and what we've seen and we continue to see and we continue to try to fight it is there's a continuous decline in habitat native environments we're destroying the environment and reducing the habitat that's having a greater impact on the rabbit population than all of those predators combined so that's a big variable if we want to increase rabbit population first step give them a place to live give them space give them habitat a place to find food and a place to reproduce then you worry about the coyotes and the hawks and the snakes and the owls and the foxes and all the other predators but without habitat it doesn't mean anything you can eliminate every predator there's only so much habitat available and that continues to get reduced every year all right so when we're talking about these relationships we often think about prey and say oh that's so sad those rabbits are poor baby rabbits well prey is not defenseless these animals or prey species plants etc they have mechanisms that keep them alive if they didn't that prey species would be extinct they'd be gone but they have different ways of surviving so look at the white-tailed deer that little baby fawn born back in April or even maybe May it is spotted so it blends into the environment it's camouflaged you can hardly see those little deer when they're young like that because they hide they blend in they tuck down into the grass and predators don't even know they're there that's because of their genetics their DNA which they inherited from mom and dad so if mom and dad had camouflage that enabled mom and dad to survive they're passing on that adaptable trait to their offspring increasing their chances of survival all right so prey often have camouflage as a defense mechanism some prey species live in a group and create a thing called a living shield okay so they work as a team they go shoulder to shoulder to defend themselves against predators they're a big school of fish or a big flock of birds so that way it decreases your chances of getting killed so down in the bottom are musk ox those animals live in the arctic up in the tundra their natural predator are wolves and when the wolves attack the musk ox group together they form a circle the young the sick the injured the old the weakest members of the herd get pushed into the center of the circle all the healthy adults face outward so now if a wolf tries to attack it has to go through that wall through that thousands of pounds of musk ox to get to the weakest and the sickest and the injured or the old animals that are in the center that's teamwork people think about how early human civilizations fought battles when the roman soldiers were fighting they would line up shield to shield that was a key to their success working as a team so prey species often work in teams to increase their survival now sometimes as a prey species you don't live in a group you don't have camouflage instead you are just simply advertising here I am I'm dangerous this is a strawberry dart frog from Costa Rica that frog is very obvious very distinct and very noticeable that stands out but what he's doing is warning predators look if I'm not trying to hide there's a reason for this I'm dangerous I have a toxin in my skin you try to eat me you're gonna get sick so don't try it one predator might try it you know, a bird may say oh I'm gonna eat that brightly colored frog and it attacks and it gets sick and it learns now the individual frogs probably dead but that's a survival mechanism built into the genetics of the species so one frog died that strawberry dart frog may have died but the species survives because that bird learned don't mess with those bright colored frogs they're dangerous they're 
they have toxin, don't do it. Okay, so there's lots of different mechanisms here. Another one is what we call mimicry. And we see two types of mimicry in nature. Okay, so our first one here is called Batesian. Batesian mimicry. The mimic does not have the defense mechanism. It doesn't possess a defensive mechanism that enables it to be deadly. It just looks really scary. So if you took a quick glance at both of these snakes, are you going to grab one? Which one's dangerous? Which one can kill you with one bite? Mm, you're hesitating. Snake got away. That's what it's meant to do. Cause a predator to hesitate, allows the prey to escape. So when we look at this type of mimicry, red on yellow is a bad fellow. So if you look at how the bands of color are placed on this coral snake, the one on top here, notice the red band is directly connected to a yellow band. So red sits on top of or next to yellow. That is a deadly snake. That is a coral snake. One bite, there's enough venom, it can kill a person. But down below, we got the king snake. If you look at the king snake, black on red, it's okay. So here's your black band. Here's your red band. So the black bands border the red. That snake is harmless. When you have time to study and really look at it, sure, you can tell a difference. But again, think about it. This is a living animal. You go after this snake to catch it, to kill it, to eat it. It's not sitting around to let you study. It's going to be moving and trying to escape. And if you pause to, oh, i got to evaluate the color, and uh, is it dangerous, you're out of there. That is Batesian mimicry. The only way this works is if the population ratios are skewed. So let's say you have 100 deadly ones, and you might only have five cheaters or mimics in the community. That way, if a predator does attack, it gets the nasty one. It's almost guaranteed it's going to eat a nasty snake or be attacked and bit and injured by a snake that possesses a defense mechanism. And that way it just doesn't mess with anybody that looks like that. So the mimic kind of sneaks around and cheats, it looks dangerous, but never actually has to act or be dangerous. So if those ratios of those populations shift, Batesian mimicry collapses and it doesn't work. That becomes a big problem for both species involved. Okay, so that's one type of mimicry. The second type is what we call malarian. In malarian, both species have the defensive mechanism. Okay, they're both dangerous. They're both deadly. They both have a toxin. So when we look at these butterflies, you're like, wow, the one on the right, the one on the left, they're almost identical. Both of them possess that defensive mechanism in each of these different rows here. So if you're a bird and you attack this butterfly, ugh, I got sick. Oh, I'll attack this butterfly. Ugh, I got sick. I attack this one. Ugh, I got sick. Am I going to attack this one? No. Why attack it? You got sick from something that looked just like it. So it doesn't matter which one you attack, you're going to get sick. You're going to feel the defense mechanism. Now, population-wise, the population ratios are not that critical. You can have 100 and 100 because any of these individuals will have the defense mechanism and it's going to help ward off predators, keep them away because they're going to have a negative experience when they try to attack any of these butterflies. Right, so our Illinois example, there's a butterfly called the monarch and then another one called the viceroy. Which one has the toxin? Which one is the mimic? Is that malarian or is that Batesian mimicry that we have going on right here in Illinois? Okay, there's lots and lots of examples out there. I encourage you guys, look at them. You know, think about bees. We often freak out. Oh, they're dangerous. Most bees can't even sting you. They don't have a stinger designed to sting. So check it out. We'll talk more about relationships in our next lecture in community ecology.